Hello. So this video is going to be a little fun. By now, I'm sure some of you are aware that the United States House of Representatives recently passed a bill to spend $1.6 billion on spreading anti-China propaganda over the next five years. And trust me, I already know what you're thinking. Nice fucking use of our tax money. Also a nice use of our tax money to send $8.7 billion in weapons to the Zionist terror state, right after a fucking hurricane hits the southeast coast. Absolutely amazing. But no, China's the bad guy here, right? They're the ones oppressing their people and supporting violence and authoritarianism. Because it's not like Congress could spend that $1.6 billion on paying off the teeniest, tiniest amount of medical debt or student debt, or spent an extra $3.2 billion to end homelessness completely, or even just invest it towards developing developing renewable energy, better waste management, and energy efficiency. Nope. Unfortunately, the ruling class is more worried about the rise of another socialist superpower upending their global hegemony. Honestly, I was already starting to question my hate for China anyway, but now I'm fucking done. If spending $1.6 billion on spreading misinformation and rhetoric against China is the kind of game we're playing, then I'm not trusting another fucking word out of Western media, and neither should you. Which is why today's focus will be three lies we've been fed about the People's Republic of China and what the truth is. As usual, I'll try to leave links to my sources in the description. The first lie I want to go over is everyone's favorite lie, the Tiananmen Square Massacre, also famously known as just Tiananmen Square, and known by leftists as the June 4th Incident. For this, and at least one other lie, I'll be basing my arguments around a paper written by the nice folks with the Deprogram. For those who don't know who the Deprogram are, they're a podcast consisting of the top three socialist content creators on YouTube. I highly recommend listening to at least one of their podcasts. Anyway, story goes, guy stands in front of a tank in Tiananmen Square, someone takes a picture, it gets shared with the West, and boom rumor is he was killed. Therefore, China bad. The long version of this story, in 1989, China supposedly declared martial law to suppress students that were protesting for so-called democracy and freedom. On June 4th that year, the Chinese government deployed its military and fired upon thousands that were supposedly protesting in the square. Some will even tell you that the tanks ran over the students and that blood flowed in the streets like a river. Despite the fact that claims and propaganda about the June 4th incident have proven inconsistent, this will always be one of the first things that anti communist cherry pick whenever the topic of China and their politics is brought up in debate. Let's start with background. 13 years prior to the June 4th incident, Mao Zedong passed away, and a power struggle ensued which saw the Gang of Four being purged. This allowed Deng Xiaoping to rise to power, who implemented the Four Modernizations. Deng's policy would lift millions out of poverty, but leave an opening for inequality, corruption, and social unrest. The Chinese people by and large saw it as a betrayal of Mao's principles, and they felt that their government was caving to the capitalist Western bloc. The protesters at Tiananmen Square, however, did not represent the Chinese people, but a layer of intelligentsia, being intellectuals who possess political and cultural influence, who were pushing for a return of class society, demanding higher wages for themselves, better privileges for themselves, and more political power for themselves. The truth is that the Tiananmen Square protests did not end in a massacre. This is just a narrative that Western media came up with just from seeing a guy standing in front of a line of tanks, and being told that that was in China. Jay Matthews, first bureau chief of the Washington Post went to China to cover the demonstrations, and wrote in his 1998 article the following. Over the last decade, many American reporters and editors have accepted a mythical version of that warm, bloody night. They repeated it often before and during Clinton's trip. On the day the president arrived in Beijing, a Baltimore Sun headline, June 27th, page 1A, referred to Tiananmen, where Chinese students died. A USA Today article, June 26th, page 7A, called Tiananmen the place where pro-democracy demonstrations were gunned down. The Wall Street Journal Journal, June 26th, page A10, described the Tiananmen Square massacre, where armed troops ordered to clear demonstrators from the square killed hundreds or more. The New York Post, June 25th, page 22, said the square was the site of the student slaughter. The problem is this. As far as can be determined from the available evidence, no one died that night in Tiananmen Square. The source of this quote appears to have been torched, but the claim is corroborated by articles written by the BBC, CBS News, and the New York Times. WikiLeaks even obtained secret cable from the U.S. Embassy in Beijing, which all but confirmed that there was no bloodshed in Tiananmen Square on June 4, 1989. Gregory Clark, an Australian diplomat and Chinese-speaking correspondent of the International Business Times, claims that even the protesters themselves have said nothing happened beyond the Chinese military asking them to leave. Thomas Hong Wing Pullen wrote that the massacre part took place on Chang'an Avenue and was initiated by rioters. The focus of the protests in Tiananmen Square was personal gain and not freedom and democracy. Among the 
opportunistic student leaders is Chai Ling, who explains that she attempted to bait the Chinese military into actually committing a massacre in Tiananmen Square. Here, we see photos taken of the riots, proving that, if anything, the bloodshed was initiated by the students, and that the PLA were attacked first. And to top it all off, the rioters were able to escape arrest by fleeing the country, being aided by the CIA, MI6, the Alliance, and Chinese criminal syndicates, known as triads, in what is called Operation Yellow Bird. Almost all of them gained privileged positions. Everything I've shown you has been linked in the description, including additional resources, which include video essays, books, and articles. You can research it yourself, all it costs is an open mind, and a willingness to change your perspective when presented with new evidence. The second most favorite lie of anti-communists, and the second lie I'll be covering in this video, is the supposed Uyghur genocide taking place in Xinjiang. I was sold on this lie as well, in fact there's probably still a video of me on this channel from like 2019 or something, talking about how China is terrible because of it. But the Deep Program has a neat little paper on this issue as well that I'd like to show you. According to Western media, Muslims in the Muslim-majority autonomous region of Xinjiang are being mass incarcerated, indoctrinated, having their organs harvested from them, and even being forcefully sterilized. Let's start with the background. The 25 million population of Xinjiang is home to many ethnic groups, the largest of which being the Uyghur people, but also Han Chinese, Kazakhs, Tajiks, and other smaller groups. After the end of the Cold War, Uyghur nationalism experienced a resurgence in popularity. The East Turkestan Liberation Organization was a militant group formed in 1997 and went defunct in 2003. They have been designated as a terrorist group by China, Kazakhstan, and Kyrgyzstan. Members had been arrested abroad in Turkey for attacks on ethnic Han Chinese visiting or living in the country. Attacks by Uyghur nationalists are not limited to between the years of 1997 and 2003, however. A larger organization known as the Turkestan Islamic Party is responsible for most terrorist attacks in China. The group was also founded in 1997 and has been designated as a terrorist organization by China, the UN, the EU, Argentina, Japan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Malaysia, New Zealand, Pakistan, Russia, Turkey, the UAE, and the UK. No US, unfortunately, who will more than happily call Hamas a terrorist group. Anyway, in 2008, two men drove a truck into a group of 70 jogging police officers in Kashgar before attacking them with grenades and machetes. This resulted in 16 deaths. In 2009, ethnic riots broke out in Rumchi, the capital of Xinjiang, that targeted people of Han Chinese ethnicity. This resulted in the destruction of several buildings and vehicles, over 1,700 injuries, and almost 200 people, most of which being Han Chinese or non-Muslim minorities, being killed. Another attack in Kashgar in 2011, in which two men hijacked a truck, killed the driver, and drove into a crowd of pedestrians before getting out and stabbing people, injuring 27 and killing 6. Other separate attacks drew the death toll to 23. Kashgar was attacked a third time in 2013 when Uyghur militants carried out attacks on police stations and government buildings, killing 15 and injuring 40. Also in 2013, in what could be called the real Tiananmen Square Massacre, a militant drove a car into the square in a suicide bombing, 5 people died and 12 were injured. In 2014, Aramchi was attacked again when militants drove SUV into a busy street market, threw explosives at shoppers as they ran others down, before the SUVs collided and exploded. 43 were killed, 90 were injured. Also in 2014, a group of eight knife-wielding Uyghur nationalists attacked a train station in Kunming, Yunnan, killing 31 and injuring 143. Between the years of 2014 and 2016, around the time the Uyghur genocide narrative started floating around, China carried out a campaign known as the Strike Hard Campaign to crack down on terrorism in the region of Xinjiang. This resulted in thousands being detained reports of mass detention and forced labor began to emerge. This, however, did not come without enfranchising ethnic Uyghurs. There are material conditions that cause marginalized groups and individuals to feel that extremism is a necessary course of action. Hell, I was in that spot at one point. After losing my job in 2022, the government refused to grant me unemployment benefits, and the way back into the workforce meant taking some low-paying fast food job. I started mentally planning out revenge in the form of mass shootings, arson, and raids. Terrorism does not appear out of thin air, and this is something that China realized and approached the rise of Uyghur nationalism and terrorism with, and the Strike Hard campaign sought to prevent further terrorist attacks by 1. Arresting anyone planning such attacks, and 2. Enfranchising the Uyghur ethnic group. The OIC, Organization of Islamic Cooperation, released a document in 2019 titled Resolutions on Muslim Communities and Muslim Minorities in the Non-OIC Member States, in which they spoke highly of China's treatment towards their Muslim minority. The document seemed more concerned with the treatment of the Rohingya community in Myanmar, which Western media is, for a lack of better terms, silent on. In addition to the OIC document, over 50 UN member states, consisting mostly of Muslim-majority nations, signed a letter to the UN Human Rights Commission 
Commission approving of China's de-radicalization efforts in Xinjiang, noting that there has not been a single terrorist attack in the country since the strike hard campaign ended. Vocational education and training centers were set up in the region, only for propagandists to unfortunately accuse them of being forced labor camps. The letter also noted that the people of Xinjiang feel happier and safer. The World Bank even sent a team to investigate, only to find that the allegations of human rights abuses by China in Xinjiang were false. Even U.S. State Department lawyers, who still accuse China of crimes against humanity, failed to find sufficient evidence of a genocide taking place in Xinjiang against the Uyghurs, committed by the Chinese government. In a comparative analysis, we can look at the U.S. response to terrorism. Although Islamic terrorism is not domestic for the U.S., our government is completely apathetic to the material conditions that cause terrorism, and if anything has been a direct instigator to terrorism, especially Islamic terrorism. Our government used the September 11, 2001 terrorist attacks as a justification to launch an invasion of Afghanistan in an attempt to overthrow the Taliban government for harboring Al-Qaeda militants, which, as we know, eventually failed. Our government accused Saddam Hussein's government in Iraq of having links to terrorist organizations and developing weapons of mass destruction and used this as an excuse to invade the country. Saddam's government was Arab socialist and anti-imperialist. The U.S. invasion of Iraq succeeded, and the Arab socialist Ba'ath Party was banned, allowing for a more West-friendly social democratic party to take its place. As I hope we all here accept this fact, there were no weapons of mass destruction being developed by Iraq, nor did Saddam Hussein's government have any links to terrorist organizations. Our government also justified an invasion of Syria over terrorist attacks perpetrated by ISIS, and staged a coup against the Arab Socialist Assad government. Even worse, though, is that the Bush administration planned to attack several other Muslim-majority countries in addition, and between 897,000 and over 1 million innocent people were killed as a result of U.S. interventions and invasions in Afghanistan, Iraq, Pakistan, Syria, Yemen, and other countries. The number of people displaced ranges from 37 million to at least 59 million. Not to mention a certain U.S. puppet in the region that has bombed and raped its way through Gaza, frequently raids and bullies the West Bank, and has now turned its attention to Lebanon, and in the past year alone has claimed the lives of at least 200,000 innocents. Compare this to the mere handful of Islamic extremists China has executed, and mere thousands that they have incarcerated for planning to carry out further attacks, while simultaneously re-educating and enfranchising the people of Xinjiang and people of Uyghur ethnic background and Muslim religious background. Which one sounds more genocidal? And yet neither the U.S. nor its puppets will actually ever be charged with genocide because of the Hague Invasion Act. The United States is more or less the Third Reich if the Third Reich had won World War II. Continuing with the Uyghur genocide narrative, let's call out the people responsible for peddling it. Adrian Zenz, a German Christian fundamentalist, ironic, and director of China Studies for the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation. Zenz believes he is being led by God on a mission against China. His use of data relies on highly questionable sources and anonymous Uyghur testimony testimonies, meaning that these individuals are either Islamic extremists from Xinjiang or don't exist at all, as would be expected of someone working with a foundation that considers Wehrmacht soldiers and SS officers as victims of communism. He ignores key factors that played into the rise of Uyghur nationalism and extremism, and how China managed to solve the issue without invading three different countries and establishing a puppet regime to continue its dirty work. We also have the World Uyghur Congress to blame, as an organization that isn't even headquartered in Xinjiang, but in Germany. Common theme here. The the World Uyghur Congress is funded by the National Endowment for Democracy, which supports American imperialist interests rather than the interests of the communities that they claim to support. Radio Free Asia, a U.S. propaganda outlet that exports its content all throughout East Asia that is headquartered in Washington, D.C., has also peddled the Uyghur genocide narrative. We should also look into why the Uyghur genocide narrative is even being promoted, and it all has to do with the Belt and Road Initiative. The Belt and Road Initiative is basically what the Silk Road was, but in the era of global organization. It's a massive infrastructure development project that aims to build ports, highways, railways, corridors, and other infrastructure in countries all across Asia, the Middle East, Europe, and Africa. Xinjiang is a critical part of the belt. China's economic ambitions conflict with America's imperialist interests, however, and the initiative is seen as a threat to American global hegemony. Fabricating claims of a genocide against Uyghurs would have turned the tides against China by damaging their reputation on the world stage, leading to sanctions which would harm China's economy and result in the worsening of Islam extremism. It's a domino effect that could easily reach the point of Xinjiang breaking away and fighting in a rebellion against the People's Republic. Concluding this point, I'd like to point you in the direction of the additional resources section of the paper written by the D program. Again, these are video essays, books, articles, and other information resources that could help you gain a better understanding of the situation in Xinjiang. Links to all of them will be in the description. All it costs is an open 
open mind and a willingness to change your perspective when presented with new evidence. This next one isn't so much a lie, but rather a misconception, something that people are quick to jump to conclusions on. I am, of course, talking about the sweatshops, something that is undoubtedly left unchecked as a result of Deng's industry and market reforms and for modernizations. And for this, I turn to the Reddit community Communism 101, a post by a user hoping to gain a better understanding of this issue and Chinese labor laws in general. And I found a pretty good answer with links to sources, which you'll be able to find all of them in the description. By the way, I highly recommend going through Communism 101 for research and discourse regarding socialism and communism, as well as research and discourse on some issues regarding socialist and communist experiments, organizations, and individuals. Anyway, the comment reads, The problem with China's sweatshops wasn't labor laws, but the lack of the rule of law. Massive corruption was highly exploited, allowing factory owners to ignore any and all laws. China has very good labor laws, very worker-friendly, said Steve Feniger, a managing director of SS Partners, a trading company who has spent nearly three decades in China. The problem is that nobody implements them. The Ministry of Labor and Social Security in China employs 20,000 full-time labor inspectors, according to its annual statistical bulletin. The ministry says it audited 1.2 million business units last year and handled 250,000 cases of employee complaints, including repayment of back wages, to 8.4 million workers. But inspectors say the government's presence is barely felt in the factories they visit, partly because there is no political will to crack down. Article being cited here was published by the New York Times. China has made amazing strides in this area as of the writing of this article. Since she has been president, there has been an implementing of greater rule of law, cracking down on corruption, eliminating sweatshop conditions, and paying back those who have been highly exploited, usually migrant workers. Links presented to go over labor rights in China, the paying back of stolen wages, easing the exploitation of migrant workers, and China's anti-corruption campaign, something that many of China's billionaires have been on the receiving end in recent years. Like, I find it funny that memes like this are posted around to own the commies. Meanwhile, neolibs cry when billionaires are sentenced to death in the country for being shitheads. Anyway, workplace safety is now better than Australia. Wages growth is breakneck, and conditions are improving for even the poorest of Chinese. Furthermore, the Chinese state allows workers to take matters into their own hands as well. There are numerous cases of Chinese workers beating the bosses and CEOs to death, and the Chinese state sides with the workers, even in cases where the CEO was a foreign national. Links cited go over China's efforts in eliminating poverty, China beating Australia in workplace safety, China's rising wages, and Chinese workers overthrowing corporate overlords. In conclusion, our anonymous comrade writes, The problem was the lack of governance and rule of law, not the presence of it, as is what's trying to be implied. Ironically, China is critiqued when rule of law is present, China is totalitarian, and when it's not. China has sweatshops. Double standards sure are fun, aren't they? China's damned if they do and damned if they don't. Meanwhile, the United States gets off the hook for fucking anything, be it neglecting the working class or oppressing it. Like, why does China get shit for having sweatshops in their country despite working to crack down on them? But here in the States, we've tolerated our government deliberately delaying and denying us a wage increase in any capacity for almost 16 years. I was in fourth fucking grade when the minimum wage was last updated. But no, China bad because sweatshops, Uyghurs, Tiananmen. But the United States gets off the hook for the Battle of Blair Mountain. The United States gets off the hook for funding and supporting the Gaza genocide, both Harris and Trump and President Biden all approving of Israel and the IDF's actions. Even as every home, every school, every hospital in Gaza has been demolished by Israeli airstrikes. The US gets off the hook for not raising the minimum wage for almost two fucking decades, causing many to have lost their homes and many more to have died of overwork as they try to make ends meet or starvation as a result of of lacking funds to be able to afford anything, shelter over their heads, and food in their stomachs. China's the bad guy no matter what. There are a little scapegoat, but the US can do no wrong, right? Anything bad that happens is all China's fault. And even though Congress is just throwing away money on propaganda campaigns and weapons packages to Ukraine and Israel, instead of, you know, spending it on disaster relief for those affected by the hurricane, we only have to wait on our government to magically ward off this perceived threat of communist influence for things to get better. You're being fooled. Please, everyone, liberals and conservatives especially, stop letting politicians think for you. Just stop, okay? I don't care who you think is going to be worse or better for Palestine. I don't care if you're afraid of abortion being banned if Trump wins. Abortion is going to be banned even if Harris wins. Biden failed epically to protect abortion rights. Harris will prove no better. The two-party system is a joke. It is a sham. Stop letting these people think for you. They are not your friend, and they do not have your best interests in mind. They only work for two things, 
one, world hegemony and American imperialism, and two, the elevation of the clergy, aka capitalists, the bourgeoisie, the people that own private property, and the oppression of the working class, commoners, the lower strata. Do yourself a favor and enlighten yourself. Look into the sources I've left in the description. Do your own research on these issues. Do your own research on socialism and communism in general. And take it upon yourself to uncover the truth about capitalism. And don't just look to me for answers and counter-arguments either. I'm probably not the most educated or principled socialist even on this platform. I've already recommended the D program. I highly suggest watching the content of the three comrades that make it up. Second Thought, Hakim, and Ugopnik, as well as First Thought, which is ran by them as well, as a news and analysis channel. Those are just the biggest three. There are tons of socialist channels out there that focus on things such as analysis, video essays, theory, debates, debunking, exposing, and not to mention the socialist and communist parties and organizations from all over the world with social media accounts on YouTube. You can start literally right now. Get out there and deprogram yourself. As for my comrades, I hope you found this video informative and that you feel better equipped to take these issues on in debates and arguments with friends and family. If you know of any other lies about China being spread by the capitalist propaganda machine or lies about other social socialist and communist experiments, organizations, parties, or individuals, or about socialism and communism in general, and you have sources, do feel free to publish it in the comments below. The more the merrier. Anti-communists will be tempted to scroll through the comment section to find like-minded people calling this video a heap of nonsense. Obstruct their search by posting comments, debunking other lies, adding context that I left out, or even just sharing your thoughts. And I think that's all I have to say. Do me a favor before you click off, hit the thumbs up button, it'll help me stay relevant in the algorithm, share this with friends and family, and subscribe for more content like this as there will be more. And click the bell to get notified when I upload. Thank you for watching and I'll be back soon with another video. Bye guys.